Clams usually have one line of defense against a predator, their tough shells. But this researcher, my name is Dr. Lindsay Doherty, just discovered that this clam, the disco clam, may have a unique defense mechanism. A mesmerizing light show. The fact that this clam was opening in the middle of an attack to flash at the predator made no sense to us. Especially given that the predator is the fearsome mantis shrimp, known for its incredibly powerful punch. I got hit once and, you know, was bruised for a month. But when the disco clam meets a mantis shrimp, Doherty discovered something bizarre. The mantis shrimp itself, they actually went into a catatonic state for up to 15 minutes. So I think this is one of the greatest matchups in the animal kingdom. Can you uh, talk about the combatants we have on, on both sides? They're two very popular and very unique creatures. So mantis shrimp are not technically shrimp. Uh, their taxonomic group is stomatopods. So there are two main types. There are smashers, which smash things. So they usually feed on hard-bodied prey, things like clams, um, snails. And then there are spears, which sort of look like the Edward scissor hands, I suppose, of the underwater world. In this case, because we're dealing with a clam or a hard-bodied predator, we studied the smashing mantis shrimp, which can actually hit at the speed of a six caliber bullet and cause cavitation underwater. So it's a quite unique strike. It does strike with such force that it creates these cavitation bubbles. Can you walk us through what those are and, and what happens when they explode? The easiest way to explain it is sort of that they essentially boil the water. It's actually creating an area of low volume um, that creates this boiling. And when that bubble collapses, it actually can create a shockwave that can stun their prey items. They can actually break aquarium glass. Uh, we had this happen. It's a very interesting evolutionary adaptation to feed on things that are traditionally hard to get at, like a clam that has a thick calcium carbonate shell. So switching to the, the clams, what is a disco clam and why is it called such? A disco clam is a type of file clam. Uh, disco is a colloquial term. People also call them flame scallops or electric scallops. Um, they are technically a clam, not a scallop. But they live in the Indo-Pacific on coral reefs. And what they typically do is they find a small hole that they can get inside. Uh, and they'll use bissel threads to attach themselves inside that hole and then they'll stick out their tentacles and they'll be flashing anytime there's ambient light. So one side of the tissue is reflective. It actually has tiny silica nanospheres, which if you think about it, are essentially like teeny tiny disco balls inside their tissue that are really effective at reflecting light. And then on the other side, it's absorbent. Um, so they basically show the reflective side and then hide it. Um, almost like an audience doing a wave at a football game. And that's why to our eyes, when it happens very quickly, it looks as though they're flashing. And they speed up when you scare them or give them food. So anything that sort of excites them will speed up that flashing display. And this is fundamentally different from how most other critters in the sea who, that produce light are going about it. How is this different from bioluminescence? A lot of people actually thought it was bioluminescence initially. The difference is you can see it during the day, and usually bioluminescence isn't bright enough to be seen during the day. Uh, this is based fully on structure within the tissue, whereas bioluminescence is a chemical reaction that actually produces light instead of heat. Um, so yeah, it's quite different. It's quite unique. And you did a study recently that looked at this matchup between the mantis shrimp and the disco clam. What did you find in this study? So the most interesting uh, interaction was the disco clam opening mid-attack. So when you think about a clam, they're usually their best line of defense is their shell, right? They can close very tightly, um, as anyone who's ever tried to open one knows. And so the fact that this clam was opening in the middle of an attack to flash at the predator made no sense to us, right? Like that's your best, you know, line of defense when you're being attacked by this voracious predator. The mantis shrimp itself also has a very strange reaction to that red external tissue. They actually went into a catatonic state for up to 15 minutes. Given that the mantis shrimp goes into this catatonic state, might that open it up to its own predation? Like that's kind of this weird symptom of the disco clam doing its thing and, and then the predator itself gets eaten. There's clearly something going on that the mantis shrimp is very unsure of when they encounter this tissue. So that's why, you know, we wanted to look at the tissue further and see if we could figure out what was going on that made it so unique and unpalatable. 
So the mantis shrimp is famous for being a voracious predator. It's eating a lot of different things in the sea. Uh, are there any indications that it's, you know, off-put by any other potential prey items other than the disco clam? They're not what I would call picky eaters. Um, I know my PhD PI fed one a blue ring octopus, uh, which has enough deuterotoxin to kill eight adult humans. So not something most people would willfully eat. The fact that we saw this strange interaction with the disco clam fascinated us from a behavioral point of view because there's just not much that will sort of throw off the mantis shrimp, especially to the point of going into a catatonic state and cleaning their mouth parts and just clearly being very annoyed <laughs> at what they were encountering. I think it's also interesting because these are, are you know, intelligent, as, as we can define it, um, creatures that I've seen them actually blow limbs off of crabs and things like that. They're crafty animals, and it's just interesting to see them kind of fall to pieces when they come across a disco clam. Yeah, so they can be very manipulative um, with the morphology of any creature that they encounter. I think they have to be in order to get various things open and avoid getting hurt themselves while they're predating upon something. So to see them not only go catatonic, but just seem to be completely lost. You know, I don't know how to deal with this bright red clam that's flashing at me. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. Um, it's a pretty fascinating behavior to encounter. I mean, in general, animals usually don't do something unless there's some sort of benefit to them, right? You don't want to expend too much energy unless it benefits you in some manner. And it's not always the case, but most of the time that's true. So it could be that this flashing, you know, is just a really catchy evolutionary thing to sort of show predators, don't eat me, you'll regret it. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about the evolutionary side of things. I mean, could it be that the disco clam has evolved this uh, defense specifically for something like a mantis shrimp to be able to confuse it? And one thing that's really important in animal behavior is to remember to consider the visual capability of the predator you're assuming is attacking, right? So all these different groups that could potentially eat disco clams all have different visual capacity. Um, mantis shrimp in particular have up to 16 photoreceptors, which, you know, we as humans have three. So they've got us a little bit beat there. This is an Indo-Pacific species that has evolved this display and Indo-Pacific reefs are incredibly colorful and you sort of have to do a lot to stand out, right? So if you're trying to advertise that you're poisonous or distasteful, um, you have to be creative in order to do it. Given the uniqueness of the structure in the disco clam that's, that's producing this light, might there be some inspiration here for human designs for disco balls or otherwise? <laughs> A disco clam disco ball. Um, yes. I mean, I like to say that anything we can do, nature does better. There's a lot that we can learn about structural coloration from things like morpho butterflies that use, you know, a very specific interaction between tissue and light in order to create really amazing displays of color. So um, there's actually a Qualcomm display that's based on, you know, movable mirrors um, that can create sort of more light when there's a bright light outside. So if you think about using a tablet, you know, if you're trying to read a book on your tablet and you go outside and there's too much light, you suddenly can't see the screen. And if we learn from nature and how animals use structural coloration, given more ambient light, the screen can actually get brighter if that screen itself can interact um, with the light that's coming in. So with disco clams, you know, we initially studied the, the size of the silicon nanospheres, um, their spacing against one another. All of that showed us essentially that they're optimized for a blue light environment and that their reflection is really quite impressive for a natural animal. Uh, in spectrometry, we look at something called a white standard, which essentially should reflect every color of the visible spectrum, um, which gives you white. So the disco clam was quite close to that, um, you know, ideal standard. And it's it's pretty amazing to have a reflector that that is that powerful, especially underwater where your light environment is quite limited. So in the ocean, being able to reflect, you know, the entire visible spectrum is particularly impressive because red light attenuates so quickly, um, as do other wavelengths as you go a little bit deeper. The thing that I was most interested in is the actual flashing display. And unfortunately, the disco clam is the only bivalve I know of that has anything like that. So um, in a perfect world, I would love to look at different potential predators and see how they measure up against the disco clam. But yeah, it's something that we can potentially do in the future. 
I guess generally speaking, the disco clam is staying alive. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll, I'll show myself out now. <laughs> Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me.